welcome to another episode of the Liberator Podcast. My name is Sam Riley. I'm here with James Silverman as usual. We've got no Russell Hunter this time, but we do have Rachel Berkey, a Free the State staff member. You are all familiar with her. And we are excited about the episode today. We're going to be talking about something that is uh, really... In all the headlines. Yeah, it's really popular right now. <laughs> yeah, it's all the rage right now. And it shouldn't be. Uh, but basically, it's the it's the subject of a lot of pro-choice hysteria, pro-abortion hysteria, and pro-life celebrating. But pro-lifers are really ready to celebrate a whole lot of stuff. So um, anyways, we're talking about SB8, the heartbeat bill in Texas. Um, it is, at, you've heard of it, I'm sure. Uh, we're going to be just addressing it point by point and just giving a critical evaluation of whether or not Christians should celebrate this law. And this is really applicable across the nation right now. There are different versions of this bill um, in different ways uh, in the state in state legislators across the country. We have two different versions of this here in Oklahoma, the yep. Oklahoma legislature right now. And you need to know the different ways that this is wrong and how to respond to arguments for this bill and versions of this bill. Mm -hmm. Yep. So with that, before we get into the four reasons why we don't support this bill, why we don't think anyone else should, uh, let's talk about how we even judge whether or not a bill is good or bad, how we judge whether or not a reason is legitimate for or against a bill. Um, so in this episode, we're going to go through four reasons why we do not support this bill and other bills like it and why we don't think anyone else should either. But before we even get into that, let's talk about how we even judge a bill. How do we, what criteria do we use to say this bill is good or this bill is not good. So from an abolitionist perspective, how would we even address trying to figure out whether or not this is a good or a bad bill? Yeah. Uh, so we would say it's based on what the Word of God says about a bill. Um, a lot of pro-lifers, when they talk about bills, they're just going to be hammering constantly, you don't want to save as many babies as possible. Like, that's the thing that they yeah. really hone in on. And uh, it's, it's kind of like, well... No, I don't think that you're going to save as many babies as you think you're going to save because God doesn't like your bill. Like God says he hates partiality. He does not, uh, he does not like it when you excuse the wicked. Um, he doesn't like it when you enact iniquitous decrees. God says he hates these things. And so yeah. when we look at chance of actual success, even on the pragmatic side, if we're thinking providentially, then we're thinking this isn't going to work because God doesn't bless these kinds of efforts. He typically curses these kinds of efforts. When we look at what God does in the Bible, he does not treat well people who do this kind of thing. Um, and he may not strike people down who do this, but he's certainly not going to bless the endeavors of people that are thinking this is just a pragmatic, schemey, practicing, cunning thing that's going to get us to be able to save babies. It's people that are saying, let's trust God, let's do what God says, let's submit our bills to what God says, and uh, actually conform to his word that are going to be successful just because God blesses that kind of thing. We know that he blesses that kind of thing. That's what his word says. And so when we're assessing a bill critically, we should be looking at what type of bill is going to please God, not what type of bill is going to please any given legislature throughout the states. Because that's what most pro-lifers look at. Yeah. They think, well, if I'm in Washington, I've got to pass this bill that's kind of like, well, maybe parental consent. Maybe I can get that through in Washington. Yeah. Um, so they'll try all these other bills to please the legislature, but not to please God. And you've got that totally reversed. Pa try to pass a bill that will please God, and that's the only thing that's going to change culture. That's the only thing that has power. Yeah. What if, uh, what if the bill would still save some lives? Like, what if... God would use this to, to save a bunch of babies. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is what we hear a lot, you know, um, and God can take, you know, immoral means and bring about good ends, right? God can do whatever he wants. He can use whatever he wants to accomplish his purposes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact that he used Joseph's brother selling him into slavery in Egypt for good mm -hmm. does not mean we should seek to emulate Joseph's brothers, right? <laughs> so the, we, we look at what God says about murder, what he says about child sacrifice, and then we do what he says. We rescue those being led to slaughter. We don't turn a blind eye lest we be cut off from our people, like mm -hmm. Leviticus 20, right? And so there's, we, we don't emulate the evil just because God brought something good out of it, right? Mm -hmm. We need to call for justice, uh, speak as the prophets did against child sacrifice in their day, and that is what we are commanded to do. As Sam said, that is what we, ex what we can expect God to work powerfully through as opposed to these compromised political schemes. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. There, there are things that God has prescribed to happen using the intent of man. Yeah. Or there are things that God has decreed will happen using the intent of man and things that God has prescribed in his law. And Christians are supposed to look at what God prescribes for his law, what he says for civil government, and follow that. Yeah. Um, SB8 doesn't do that. SB8 says this is something that we may be able to slip back past the court system so that we can maybe save babies. Yeah. It doesn't say what ultimately pleases God. Uh, so I think that helps us get into the first reason why this bill is not good. Mm-hmm. It was a substitute for a better bill. So there right. was a bill, may, maybe people don't know this, but there was a bill in Texas that said no abortion. It's a criminal act. Anyone who commits abortion is guilty of murder and they will be punished as such. And SB8 is a bill that does not do that. It says it's not even a matter of the 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 deacons of God bearing the sword against evil. It's let's give it over to the private sector to do something instead of it's, it's a, it's giving over their own responsibility instead of taking up responsibility for what they're supposed to do and bear the sword. Right. Yeah. This, this substitute thing is very, very clear in a lot of places, but it's especially clear in Texas. Um, and so what we have in Texas is we have for the second session in a row, we've got a committee chair in Texas, Stephanie click, who killed the bill that would have completely abolished abortion in Texas would have made preborn children equal under law. She killed that bill. She, the babies are murdered in Texas today and every day until abortion is finally abolished in Texas because of Stephanie click. What Stephanie click did do is she co-authored the heartbeat bill um, and passed a whole bunch of other pro-life bills out of her committee. So Texas right to life sees that they give her the pro-life hero of the year award in the Texas state house, Mm -hmm. right? So So she gets to campaign as a pro-life hero even though she's the reason, the very reason babies are murdered in Texas, right? And so this bill and all the others that she put her name on or all the others that she passed out of the committee that she chairs are what gives her the political cover to keep abortion legal. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. It's it's happening in Oklahoma. It's happening in Missouri, Idaho. Wherever there's abolition bills, we can see this. But it's been especially clear in Texas um, where we saw Stephanie Click, again, pro-life hero, but she kept abortion legal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's as as pro-life as you can get. Yeah. 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 And so when, when people ask questions like, well, will this save any babies? What they're forgetting even is there are other bills that would make it so that no babies are murdered in Texas. None. And so you're not saving babies, really. You're just mm-hmm. giving over some babies yep. to death and then pretending to save other babies where the abolition bill would have made it illegal for any of those babies to be murdered. Yep. That's the thing that's mm-hmm. actually going to abolish it, that's actually going to establish justice. And so even on the criteria of does it save babies, it fails. Yep. It, it does not stand up to the abolition bill. Um, yep. And this is something that we saw in history a lot too, and we've, we've done all these quotes multiple times on the podcast, so maybe we won't read them again, but Wilberforce, he saw, he put forward his bill to totally and immediately abolish the slave trade, and then Henry Dundas or... Uh, the guy, I'm forgetting his name right now, um, would would bring forward the, the bill up about the flags every time, and it would be used as a substitute that kind of took the wind out of Wilberforce's abolition sales and directed it toward this incremental stuff. Um, and so the abolitionists of history saw this, and we see this, and the idea that we wouldn't learn the lessons that they learned, we would keep falling into the same mistakes, um, is really absurd. We need, to, mm-hmm. we need to learn the lessons of history. We need to see what's happening in states all around the country right now, and we need to not keep Mm -hmm. falling into the same trap. We need to hold the standard of righteousness high and demand that and only that and not letting these politicians get away with doing something less than because they're always going to choose the thing that's easier to do if you allow them to do two different things. Mm -hmm. You've got to hold them to the, you got to hold the line, say this is the standard, come meet me here or we're going to vote you out. Yeah. Yeah, those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Um, the, The issue of it being a substitute is really what's wrong with pretty much every incremental bill. There's there's not an incremental bill that doesn't fall under this criticism because the legislature has a responsibility to uphold justice. And when they don't do that, they are committing a sin of omission. Like God says, that they're deacons of wrath. They're put in their place to uh, bear the sword against evildoers. And when they don't do that, they are sinning against God. When they allow little babies to be murdered, they're sinning. And God calls them to bear the sword, and do not do anything less than that. They're supposed to, if anything, the only, like the main and maybe only responsibility of uh, civil government is to bear the sword against evildoers and to command the good. Uh, but right now, we have kind of a nanny state, and we've got people that are funding 
We've got funding for all kinds of things. What we can't get is justice for the preborn, which mm-hmm. is a indictment on on our civil legislatures and um, they need to yeah. repent of this. This is something that they need to immediately repent of. It's not something to be celebrated. Okay, and the second point that we're going to talk about, the second way that this is um, wrong, is uh, this partiality. So God commands us against partiality. He says, do not show partiality. We see very plainly all throughout Scripture how God hates partiality. Um, I could list a, a ton of references. Um, James 2, 9, I believe, and um, Leviticus 19.15, Deuteronomy 1.17. Um, God hates partiality, and this shows partiality in many ways. So we're going to go co- over a couple of ways that this bill shows partiality. Uh, the name of the bill, Heartbeat Bill, points to the glaring, glaringly obviously one right there. Um, so this is a bill that protects babies after a certain Detectable point. heartbeat. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's just a, um, it's just a standard an arbitrary standard that's been set and said, okay, these are the babies that we are going to save and these are the ones that we're going to, or uh, try to save, and these are the ones that we're going to show partiality against. Mm -hmm. Um, These image bearers of God matter and these ones don't. Yep. In Texas, here is what makes a human being valuable and worthy of protection. Have a detectable heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Um, It it is partiality. I I don't think there's any argument. I don't think you can say it's not partiality. Um, I think the only argument in favor of it would be to say that, well, yeah, it is. there is some injustice here, but at least we're doing some good. At least we're saving some babies. Um, I yeah. think that would have to be the only argument because you can't, you can't argue it's not showing partiality. It yeah. is. Mm-hmm. Um, and even arguing against uh, the heartbeat as a standard, is it almost like seems like a waste of time because everyone knows that that's mm-hmm. not important at all. Yeah. You know, if someone falls down in a restaurant and their heart stops beating, um, no one's going to say, oh, they're not valuable anymore. They're going to try to get their heart beating. And yeah. if you know CPR and you don't do anything, you're going to be punished for that. Like that's actually the law. If you know CPR and you do nothing to get someone's heart beating again, when that, when they stop, their heart stops beating, then you are liable for that yeah. person's death. Um, so we all know, everyone knows that image bearers of God are worthy of protection and we need to protect them. And everyone knows that a heartbeat is not relevant towards that protection. Yeah. Um, we don't protect squirrels and they have detectable heartbeats if we wanted to try yeah. to pr- detect them. <laughs> so we know that there's nothing special about a heartbeat that makes someone more valuable or more worthy of protection. And that's just as arbitrary as the Supreme Court standard of viability. When right. the Supreme Court says, if the baby is viable, then you can put restrictions on it. You can put restrictions up to the point of viability, and they make that as the standard in Planned Parenthood v. Casey. They are being just as arbitrary as the people who put the heartbeat bill up. Yeah. And this this really is training people in partiality. It's telling people, exactly. let's be partial um, because it's really the only way you can get things done. Yeah, and that's the point I was going to make. You, you're saying that everyone you know knows that life doesn't begin in a heartbeat, and that's true. I think in you know if you've you know if you've graduated from sixth grade biology like you know that Mm -hmm. right it's very very obvious when life begins everyone knows that part but the like you said the bill trains people in partiality Mm -hmm. and so when you you know i spoke to my my state senator when i lived in ohio and he told me or his aide told me you know it's senator brenner's personal religious conviction that life begins at a heartbeat right that doesn't come from any Mm -hmm. sort of biology class or any you know scripture anywhere that can only come from being tutored wrongly by the heartbeat bill he was a champion of the heartbeat bill and he came to internalize that partial evil belief Mm -hmm. um and so yes it's training people to embrace partiality it's partial it's partiality inherently and then you have the secondary effect of it's training people to believe Mm -hmm. that it's it's tutoring people toward injustice Mm -hmm. there's a dad at the um the mill in ohio that i was at and he said i know that abortion is murder but my baby doesn't have heartbeat yet so it's fine Uh, there's a guy who i talked to just doing outreach on the streets in tulsa and he said yeah, I know that's really bad. I had some I had some friends that do that. Uh, th- they did that. Um, they had an abortion, but at least it was it was after it was before there was a heartbeat. It's like, mm-hmm. why does how does that make it better? Like, yeah, you know this is murder, um, but this is right. this is an excuse people are giving um, to that um, in their mind is mm-hmm. yeah. somehow and, justifying. And that was it. in the context of Ohio, where there was a heartbeat bill. There was there was a very mm-hmm. public ha- fight over the heartbeat bill for about six years, and then it finally passed, and it was big in the news again. And so that's where that comes from. Yeah. yeah. And when you're living in a culture whose whose greatest sin is 
the dehumanization of their neighbors and ageism towards their pre-born neighbors. You really want to be pushing things that are saying that is evil. Like you should not mm -hmm. be doing that because that's the only way that you're going to impact culture. That's the only way you're going to change people's hearts. Um, you're not going to change people's hearts by playing into the very ideas that allow for abortion in the first place. Cause that's what they're doing. They're, they're practicing the same type of evil uh, that they're trying to fight against. And that is a futile way of fighting. Like that is just yeah. a, in a purely pragmatic sense, that is completely futile. You're never going to get people from point A to uh, from point A to point B when you're using the premise of your enemy. Yeah. It's foolishness. It's all foolishness. You're standing on sinking sand. You're not standing on the solid rock of Christ and his word. And you're not pointing to, hey, look, they're an image bearer of God. We can't do this. It's evil. God will curse us as a nation. He will destroy the nation that does this. That's not what you're saying. You're saying, let's just switch the standard a little bit. Let's just alter it a tiny bit. You have a good opinion on this, but my opinion is probably better. So let's switch to a heartbeat. And it yeah. is just an, an issue of you arguing over opinion at that point. Yep. Yeah. It's not, it's not uh, justifiable to continue saying, well, we've got to start somewhere or, um, you know, we, we have to we have to do we have to do something save the ones that are savable no it's not about it's not about savable it's about the image of God it's not about starting somewhere it's about um, acting righteously we can't do evil that good may come mm -hmm. yeah. yeah the other part of this is uh, the third point that we have against this is that it is a matter of private enforcement as opposed to the state doing their job yep. which we touched on a little bit here but or as bradley pierce puts it the bear the sword in vain act yeah so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it is it, it's giving over to citizens uh the responsibility that doesn't fall on them you know th yeah. they're they're not the ones that are supposed to bear the sword against evildoers um yeah. private lawsuits is no response to murder you know if you're if your son or your daughter was murdered mm -hmm. and the state said to you well you can take but take up a lawsuit and you might get ten thousand dollars out of it you would be livid like you would be absolutely yeah. livid yeah. that someone would do that. Um, you would you would respond to it as the absolute wickedness that it is, and you would call on your legislator to change that and to do something, and to stop being slothful cowards who would rather give over the enforcement of something to you uh, than bear the sword themselves. Yep. Romans Romans thirteen four says, uh, "For he is God's servant for your good." But if you do good, if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Yeah, he being the governing official. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is this bill um, forbids any, uh, explicitly says that no, no one in government, no form of civil government, will enforce this at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's saying no, we will not do what God has commanded of us. We won't bear the sword. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will let them die. That's what that's what they're doing there. And one last point on the issue of partiality. When you allow for abortion up to six weeks, or I guess in this case, the way it's written, is probably more like eight or nine weeks. Um, what you get is people who are very, very careful about how they're having sex irresponsibly and making sure that they're able to murder the child before eight or nine weeks, right? And so, uh, we're, you know, we'll, we'll get into the statistics here in a minute, but even even before the statistics, you know, from people who are on the ground at the mills in Texas, what they've, what they've told me is that originally they saw a, a drop in the amount of people going for abortions at the local abortion mills, but then it's slowly kind of come back to normal amounts of abortions that are taking place. And I think the reason for that probably is it took a little bit of time for people to adjust, but when you allow for it in a certain time period, people just adjust. And so now if they have sex irresponsibly, they're just very careful to take pregnancy tests shortly thereafter. And so that they can go in and murder their baby before, you know, this, this, this cutoff. Yeah. And so when, whenever you allow for that loophole, people are going to find a way through that loophole. Mm -hmm. And so we have to treat all human beings equally. We have to not show partiality mm -hmm. and thereby maybe not encourage, but allow for and allow people to adjust to just the new, like you said, arbitrary standards mm -hmm. that are being set for who counts as a human being. Yeah. And I think that gets to the heart of what we, like the word abolition means. Like Students for Life will use the word abolition. Let's abolish abortion. But they're not using the word correctly. Like the way that we're talking about using the word is criminalization. Yeah. So we're saying the mothers who murder their babies need to be criminalized. And when you don't do that, when you 
uh, keep justice from the mothers and the fathers who murder their children, then self-managed abortion explodes. And that's essentially exactly what we saw in Texas. There was a, according to this Helio article here, and there's a good presentation by C.R. Cowley that you can watch from our conference uh, on mm-hmm. our YouTube. If you search C.R. Cowley, Free the States, it'll come up. Uh, but there was a 1,180% increase in self-managed abortion uh, through a organization called Aid Access. It's a pro-abortion organization that gives abortion pills to people that are seeking it. And I think the reported numbers that I've been hearing from pro-lifers who are saying there's been a dip in reported abortions, it's something like 2,100. Um, and then there was 1,831 requests for pill abortions um, through Aid Access in September, the same month after uh, SB 8 went into effect. So you're seeing this... No reported abortion, like less reported abortions yeah. from SB8. And the pro-lifers are saying, yes, this is so good. And then Aid Access is reporting they're getting almost the same amount of abortions uh, through self-managed abortion. So you get these sort of uh, conscience-easing uh, declarations of victory yeah. where people are like, okay, I don't have to be as, as urgent as I was before. Um, and it hasn't done anything. It's not a victory we're celebrating. You should be just as angry, just as urgent, just as ready to get abortion abolished right now, not waiting on the court, not doing any of this stuff, because it's not ending. It's not going to stop. If it is legal to kill your baby, people are going to find a way to do it. And that's exactly what we're seeing with this. This is what abolitionists have been saying for a long time and have been made fun of for a long time, but it... Turns out that it's true. People who are have murder in their heart will find a way to murder if it is legal and they're not going to face any penalty. Yeah. Whereas if you have a just system that says, yes, we are going to punish you if you murder your baby, it's a terror to them. They don't want to do it. They don't even want to drive out of state to do it. They're less likely to drive out of state to do it because they think, oh, this is murder where I live. I can be punished where I live. And so they're going to be much less likely to go and, and try to do that because they're thinking about it rightly. My preborn baby is a human, and I will be murdered if I do this. Whereas this kind, or I will not be murdered. I will be punished if I if I murder them. Is what I mean. This kind of bill communicates the opposite. Here's the window. You can do it in here. And so, if you don't want to be punished for it, um, and you're not even going to be punished in this case, then just do it in this window. Um, and that, that's exactly what happens. And on the subject of Romans 13 and uh, the civil government being a terror terror to evildoers, um, we're going to talk about the private enforcement part of this bill. Um, Bradley Pierce calls it the Bear the Sword in Vain Act. And, um, the, yeah, it's uh, essentially saying that, uh, explicitly saying, the civil government will not at all enforce this. At all. Mm-hmm. The only enforcement that is allowed, if you can call it enforcement, is lawsuit by private citizens, which is no sword at all. Against abortionists, right? Just abortionists? Just abortionists, yep. Mm. So it's not even... Or or, or any who are involved. I think it would include anyone who knowingly takes part in it, Mm -hmm. uh, except for the the parents. Except for the the murder child. Principal actor. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you ship in medical abortions, medical abortions out of state to a bunch of mothers looking to abort their babies, what happens? You know, there's no, there's, there's nothing yeah. to, that says to that mother, you're going to, you're going to get punished for it. It's just, yep. oh, pro- probably no one gets punished from this because they're out of state and they're sending it to me. The um, laws, the laws approve of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's happening and text under, under the approval of SB8. Mm-hmm. And we, we really just need to emphasize how, like wicked that is for a legislature to for 50 years not abolish abortion and then to pass this bill and say you guys handle it like you've 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 done nothing for 50 years and Texas's laws were like the basis for uh, we're we're at the root of the Roe v Wade decision they're saying you guys are being inconsistent cuz you're not punishing mothers and so you've got the same bill that doesn't punish the mother and the father who murdered their baby, uh, the same the same thing is at play there, and they're giving it over. They don't want to have anything to do with it. That is yep. a really wicked thing. And God God says like establish justice in the gate, and woe to you wicked rulers who uh, decree iniquity. That's you guys. Like that that's the people who are passing these bills. And so don't don't applaud them for doing it. There's no reason for applause here. There's reason to. 
uh, be very dissatisfied with your with your governing officials. And if you're a proud Texan, this is a time to look at your Texas legislature and say, you guys are not representing the values that we say that we believe. You're supposed to stand up towards uh, against tyrants. You're supposed to be the ones who are all about state sovereignty, but um, your legislators are just playing the Supreme Court's game and trying to finagle their way out of, um, of both um, practicing cunning to try to get around the Supreme Court's decisions and not actually doing their job, not actually defying them. Yeah. So. Yeah, children are not worth $10,000. Right. This is not justice being established. And he's saying, you're saying they're worth more, but. Yes. <laughs> I would hope that went without saying. Yeah. <laughs> that's what, that's what the lawsuit is. We didn't mention that before, but the, you can, yeah. you can sue someone, you can sue the abortionist for $10,000. Yeah. Like private citizens mm-hmm. can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Justice being established here would be pre-born children being made equal under law. Mm-hmm. Those who take part in that being charged or being making it possible for them to be charged with homicide mm-hmm. um, in the first degree, that's justice. That is the job of the legislature in Texas and every other state. To not do that is committing sin by omission. The Texas legislature committed sin by omission by not abolishing abortion, by instead doing this, uh, which is really them doing nothing because they're not enforcing this at all, right? They're, they're giving it off to the private citizens. Um, and so it's a, it's a sin of omission. It should not be celebrated. Um, and that's point three, mm-hmm. why we do not support yeah. uh, SB8 it's, or any yeah. similar legislation to it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's unjust. You know, the, the, the sort of uh, justice of, of God in the Old Testament, the eye for an eye standard of retributive justice um, is is it just parallels the golden rule. It's like the golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You want to do well to others. Uh, and the arm of justice that comes in is if you hurt somebody, if you gouge out their eye, if you take their life, you get your eye gouged out. You get your life taken because that's what you're doing to others. Like you are, there's there's both sides of that coin. You want to be gracious and good to other people. And justice is supposed to punish you when you do poorly to others. Um, to teach you, you know, like, oh yeah, it doesn't feel good when, when someone stabs your eye out. It's not good. When you rip the arms and the legs off of your little baby, that doesn't feel good. That's not good. You're doing a terrible thing to your child and there should be punishment that, that shows you, that demonstrates to you, this was murder and you did a wicked thing. Uh, and that really is something that keeps people from doing it because it tells them you're going to be punished. Like, don't do this. You're going to face the same type of thing, the same type of fate you are uh, enforcing on your child. So if you really care about my body, my choice, you should care about not ripping your baby's body apart. Um, And uh, there should be a law that says you're going to lose rights to your body if you do this because it's not your body to take. You don't get to destroy your child. So do we have anything else to say on this uh, private enforcement aspect of this before we move on to point four here? Yeah, I, I, so one thing that sort of just a, applies to all of the things that we're we're looking at here is um, people might look at this and think, why are you guys getting into all of the things that the bill literally does? Like, we're just t- – the only reason we did it is because of the consequences. We think it's going to save babies. So, like, why are you guys getting into, uh, you know, the fact that it's only private enforcement or the fact that it's partiality or, or any of that stuff? We really just want – like, all we're trying to do is – uh, basically save as many babies as possible. Well, there is a righteous means of doing things and, and we should seek righteous ends, but we should not seek any means uh, possible. Like we should not be of the mindset that anything is on the table that we can do with bills. We should be thinking, okay, what is a good bill? What is a righteous bill? Not let's just craft a bill that might save babies. Cause ultimately that's not, it's not a go- good way to go about legislation. Cause if a court looks at this stuff and they start reviewing it, there's all kinds of foolishness that anybody can rip apart. Like if someone's being consistent, if they're if they're if there's a, a judge that is looking at this bill and he's thinking, oh, pro-lifers think that abortion is murder, but they're saying uh, here that you can kill a baby if they have uh, no heartbeat or it's just private enforcement. They're thinking this is not treating it like murder, and anyone can see the hypocrisy of it. So we should not be passing bills that are hypocritical like this. And that doesn't just apply to um, the fact that it's a private enforcement or partial, but also the next point that we're going to get into is uh, trusting murderers, um, so abortionists, to 
give us reliable information about uh, where the child is in development and whether they have a detectable heartbeat. Yeah, a detectable heartbeat by the abortionist. Yeah. They're required to, to test for a heartbeat before performing the abortion and to write down in the medical record if there was or if there was not a detectable heartbeat. And um, there's, no, there's no visual or audio um, proof of that required. Um, it's just them writing down whether there was or was not a, de- a heartbeat that they detected. Mm-hmm. And if they don't de- detect a heartbeat, then it's totally fine. A physician that does not, a physician does not violate the section if the phys- physician performed a test for a fetal heartbeat as required by section 171.203 and did not detect a fetal heartbeat. Mm-hmm. If I was an abortionist, I would not look very hard for a heartbeat because I'm concerned about my paycheck and, um, that and murdering babies. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. I don't know all of the motivations. I've, kn- I've talked to some abortionists who, um, uh, who have talked about their work and they have convinced themselves that they are, they are helping women and that seems to be a driving factor. So maybe there are abortionists who aren't driven by their paycheck, but if they're driven by their, um, the lies that they have, that they believe that they are, they're helping women by murdering their children and that's what drives them, then they're going to, they're going to not look for a heartbeat in order to, um, in their understanding, to help that mom yeah. by murdering her child. Yeah, even Abby Johnson, who's repentant of, uh, or says she's repentant of being a uh, someone who assisted with murder, still put in their movie this sort of like over, like weird glorified scene where they're talking about mm-hmm. like where the abortionist is like trying to abort as many babies as possible. And it's like playing this really triumphant music. It's like, why are you? Like, she still has this image of herself. Like, you look at some of the, her Facebook posts about when she was an abortionist, she start, or when she worked at an abortion clinic, she's still thinking that she was just in it to protect women. Like, she'll say that she was just in it for helping women. And it's like, well, no, you, you weren't. Like, how do you still have that view of what you were doing? Um, yeah. People's motivations are real fickle and, 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 and weird things, but um, abortionists... Right sometimes will deceive themselves to the point of thinking that they're, you know, they're helping right. people. And, we'll, and the motivations aren't even particularly important for this point. Whatever their reasons are for wanting to murder babies, that's what they, they do for a living. Yeah, mm-hmm. They're going to n- want to murder the baby. They're going to want to not detect the heartbeat. And as Sarah Cleveland, an abolitionist ultrasound technician, has demonstrated, it's not that hard to just point the wand a little bit in the wrong direction and voila, no heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... Yes, this bill relies on the very murderer to be the judge of whether or not there is a heartbeat, and we know the murderer wants to commit murder. Yeah. Um, and so, mm-hmm. just just on that on that, um, the way this would work in practice um, isn't going to work very well. And again, that's what we're seeing in, or that's yeah. what people on the ground in Texas are seeing. They're seeing those parking lots are are, are just as full now as they were, mm-hmm. you know, back pre September. And I think part of that is people are being very very careful to you know to make sure they're detecting their pregnancies early so they can murder the babies and it's also that the abortionists are probably very willing and able to mess mm-hmm. up the ultrasound so. yeah and there's no video evidence of any of this either like they didn't even put it in their legislation you've got to submit a video of yeah. every abortion you've done uh so that we can verify that there's a right. heartbeat there uh but so just speaking of ways that people get around this law now there's i think it's trust women in texas that is just offering free abortions yeah. and that gets around the law. So, uh, you know, they get yeah. funding, they get big dollar funding from, uh, you know, uh, their well, donors yeah. who come in and, and do this. And that's, that's, and that fundraising is coming from SBA, right? So, mm-hmm. so whole women's health in, in Fort worth is saying, look, we're, you know, they're coming after us. They passed this heartbeat bill. And so they, they fundraise a whole bunch of money from that. And so now you can have abortions for free up to the, you know, detectable heartbeat or, you know, even beyond that, of course, because the abortionist is going to mess up the ultrasound. But it's free. It's free to have ultrasounds in Fort Worth now uh, because of SBA. And that's why you can't leave that loophole open. If you leave the loophole open, they're going to find a way to go through it and make it even easier to go through it in this mm-hmm. case. Yeah. Free to have so. abortions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Yes, indeed. Um, and I'm sure, you know, if you're thinking about just saving babies, uh, abortion facilities that are offering free abortions, I, I – do not think that that's going to result in lower abortion numbers. I think that you're going to have a whole lot more people who wouldn't have otherwise murdered their babies 
going in and saying, okay, I can afford this and I'm going to murder my baby. Um, it's not going, it's not in any way, uh, serving the goal that you claim to claim to be doing. It just, it's it now made it worse. And, and that's sort of the, on the William Wilberforce point that you made a little while ago, that was the observation that William Wilberforce made. It's like, you actually yeah. helped the slave trade. You made it more efficient. You made it so that less slaves are dying in transit to their locations. And so the slave trade now is more efficient than it's ever been. Um, you've made it more profitable and, and better for them. And that's exactly what happens here is they get big dollar, like big donations that come in and they're more than willing to take that money instead of the women who are coming in to get the abortions. Why wouldn't they? And so it doesn't end up helping anything. It just makes them more efficient. It makes them build bigger mega centers uh, like they're building, that, that, like they've built in Texas. It makes them look cleaner, make, makes them look like more official, uh, makes them seem more sanitized in the minds of people who are, uh, yeah. against abortion even. And why is that good? Like, why do, why does anyone want that? So those are four main problems with SB eight, with the Texas heartbeat bill. Um, and there is one thing that we wanted to address. Uh, one thing that we've heard against the heartbeat bill, um, that isn't a good argument against it that we did want to address. And that is just, um, we've heard people saying, well, Texans are just going out of state to murder mm -hmm. their babies now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why is that a bad argument? Yeah, so there, there's a, you know, if someone goes out of state with an abolition bill that's passed, um, the law is not going to follow them there, you know, if, if unless in that state it's illegal as well. So um, it's uh, it's not, if, you, if you're going to make this argument, there's a certain way that you can make it better. Like you can say, okay, well, the abolition bill passed and it's given people the understanding that this is murder. It's teaching. It's doing the function of the law. It's telling people this is something that you're going to be punished for. Um, and that is something that actually um, is a good argument. But when you say that, well, they're just going to go across state lines, it might just apply as just as equally with an abolition bill. Um, with the abolition bill, you get the added benefit of it actually is a just law and it teaches justice. It's doing that job that SB8 is not doing. So, um, I would, yeah, just be careful how you make that argument, I would say. So these have been the reasons why we don't support this bill, why we don't think others uh, should support this bill. Um, it's, it's intrinsically un unjust in multiple different ways. It's used by pro-life politicians in Texas to save their careers after they've been literally the very people mm -hmm. who made sure that abortion was not abolished in Texas. And it's the same thing here in Oklahoma. We had a bill to abolish abortion in the House, and they are not going to hear that bill. Uh, Chair Mike Osborne is not going to hear that bill. Mm -hmm. uh, but the House is going to, looks like they're going to move on both of the two bills that are similar to this one. Yeah. And so this the same concept is being applied here in Oklahoma uh, to avoid abolishing abortion mm -hmm. um, as they should do. Yeah. Um, and so it's a problem here in Texas, possibly in your state as well. And so we hope that you guys uh, were um, educated by this episode and that if you see uh, your friends celebrating either the Texas bill or bills like it that are advancing through legislatures near you, um, share this episode with those people because this is an important subject um, and especially after all the big press in, in kind of the pro-life publications, it's going to be important that we explain why this isn't something mm -hmm. um, that we need to be supporting. So. Yeah, and uh, just for anyone else that's still got some holdouts on any of these points, if you're still not totally convinced, uh, you're, you're still thinking, well, we should celebrate it because babies were saved. You're thinking babies were saved by this. Uh, just imagine if you had a 9-11 type event that was happening every month in Texas. Like every month... Buildings were getting hit by planes and people were being murdered. Would you be happy if that was decreased by 300 people dead or 2,000 people dead and only 1,000 people died? Or would you still say, this needs to stop. This, is, this needs to end now. This is not good that this is happening. I think you would have a lot more urgency if, if you actually had some uh, possible skin in the game here, if it was you that was being murdered. So we need to be urgent here. Um, this is not a matter of we can uh, clap and applaud and celebrate bills when those same bills are allowing for every single baby that is dying in Texas right now. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. they did not establish justice. And so babies are still dying in Texas. And that's not something that we're willing to celebrate. And it's not something that you should be willing to celebrate. You should reject that and not be a part of that. That's not good. Yep. 
So as always, um, we are going to do a drawing for a drawing at the end of this month. Um, we're going to have a new piece of art. Russell hasn't told us which piece of art is going to be yet this month, but we will have that uh, available for you guys soon, maybe next week. Um, but yeah, if you want to enter into that drawing uh, for a piece of Russell's original abolitionist art, uh, go to freethestates.org slash donate and become a monthly donor. Um, we, we really need your guys' support. Um, we've got a bunch of big projects we're working on. We're going to be uh, trying to help um, raise awareness about abolitionism versus pro-lifeism in various areas where there's important mm-hmm. uh, important races for, for important legislative seats going on. Um, we've got lots of other important projects we're working on, lots of conferences. We're trying to bring on some new people. Um, and so we really need you guys' support. And so we hope that you guys will do that. Mm-hmm. And you get the perk of getting your name in the bowl and possibly winning some sweet abolitionist art. Mm-hmm. And you also get the perk of getting 15% off at the Free the State store, yeah. um, which this was not for you know what's been on everyone's mind so far, Rachel nice shirts this was not planned but <laughs> we're both wearing the new shirt and this mm-hmm. will be on the free the state store um very very soon this is the hopefully. conference shirt mm. this oh, one won't be this oh, will this never one be sold will not be yeah <laughs> if you so missed out on the conference you missed out on the conference then that's uh that's on you <laughs> too bad but maybe there'll be a reprint at a, for, at a different conference uh coming up maybe we'll see not making any promises or anything. <laughs> but uh also with all the stuff that james mentioned all those perks that's yep. at a 25 dollar donation a month or more um that's just the minimum to get in, but we really would uh, appreciate whatever you can uh, afford to give because uh, we need we need the ability to pay for things. Um, you know, we need to give people raises as well at some point because uh, a lot of, like you guys don't know this, but a lot of the people at Free the States are making very little money doing this. Um, it's not about the money that we're making; it's just we are at that by necessity and if we could raise more money we could give much needed raises to people so if you know people uh that are able to support and you want to talk to them that would be very much appreciated and uh, we're an organization that needs the support and there's not really a whole lot of other people doing the type of work that we're doing especially uh in oklahoma and um yeah even across the states but james eats a lot Okay, he eats <laughs> constantly, he doesn't stop eating, and we're kind of just like, stop eating, James. You know, people bring in pizzas, and he just eats all of it, and the box. <laughs> it's gross. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, we got to feed James. Bring in the money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your support. We're very, very grateful for you. Mm-hmm. This has been another episode of the Liberator Podcast, episode 84 of the Liberator Podcast, where we're committed to being as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. We'll see you next week. With Ben's ice loft. That'll be sweet. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>